Welcome. Good day. Welcome to Western Hills Bible Church. Last week in our topic of atmospheric phenomena, we looked at events over the past 5,000 years regarding atmospheric phenomena aircraft. In conclusion of last week's study, we don't know the explanation, but the government knows these aircraft exist. Whatever's out there must have theological implications for the church. We can't ignore the possibility that we are dealing with something extraterrestrial or ultra-dimensional. Let's face it, if there is life on other worlds, we would have to reevaluate the whole New Testament. So what does this all mean from a biblical perspective? The Bible tells us that God is the creator of all things. There's nowhere you can go and not find him. God is God of time and space. So how do we explain all these sightings? They, they can't simply be dismissed. How can all this be explained? I believe that there are only seven possible explanations. First of all, there are, they are a hoax. In other words, nothing ever happened. This was all conjured up by, by people to mislead people. But this can be ruled out since scientists, astron astronomers, and pilots, they've all seen the same phenomena. Could these things be a natural phenomena such as plasma or balloons, birds, or lightning? Well, this can't explain sightings by pilots and, and people who knows what flies through the skies. So we know these things are a reality. Another possibility is these things could be interplanetary. Maybe somewhere in our solar system we are being visited by people from other planets. This is refuted by the fact that giant telescopes of the skies have failed to see anything traveling interplanetary. So these vehicles are not interplanetary in our solar system. Number four. Maybe they're intergalactic. Maybe these vessels are from another solar system. These are people visiting us from somewhere out there in, in another system of sorts. If that was the case, we would follow the same process and procedures of taking soil samples and investigating people. So intergalactic from outer space is a possible option. But here again, this can be refuted by the fact that giant telescopes of the skies, the Hubble telescope, they fail to see anything traveling interplanetary. Fifth possibility is civilization on our own planet. It is possible that there's some places around the world that we've never investigated. It's a theory. However, there's no evidence for that. Some UFOs are seen going into water. However, there's no evidence to support anything under the oceans. or no evidence under the crust or around the continents. Best evidence is this cannot be true either. Sixth possibility is maybe there's some secret weapon by the U.S. or Russia that no one's talking about. But if that was the case, someone had something in 1952 traveling at 7,000 miles an hour that was amazing. We would have both been to the moon and other planets if that was the case. So it's these things are no secret weapon. The last possibility that I think that we're dealing with is ultra-dimensional beings. Ultra-dimensional beings. What, what do I mean by that? Einstein's general theory of relativity and theory of gravity shows there is no distinction between, between time and space. In other words, time and space are endless. There's no beginning, no end to either. Einstein essentially provided a unified description of gravity as a geometric property of space and time, or let's say a fourth dimensional space-time. Einstein's theory has astro 
physical implications, which include the prediction of black holes, which are regions in space where nothing can escape them, not even light. So what does this all mean? It means that you and I, we relate to three-dimensional environment where things um, have length, width, and height. That's our dimension. That's where we live, this universe, three-dimensional. Yet, we know that there's at least a fourth dimension and probably more than that that we cannot see or realize. A fourth dimension can be thought of uh, as the unseen distance, the unseen distance. That would be like drawing two ordinary 3D cubes in a, in a uh, two-dimensional space. The unseen distance could be thought of as the unseen fourth dimension. Simply put, there are things that are in the fourth dimension that we cannot readily see. They may slip into our third dimension, but not always remain seen. Let's face it, there are sounds that we cannot hear. The human ear can hear sounds typically between 10 hertz and 100,000 hertz or cycles. We can't hear sonar, but it's out there. We, we can't hear dog whistles, but the sound's out there. And there's other, other sounds that we cannot pick up. The same with our eyes. Light. There's light we cannot see. The human eye can only see visible light. And of course, light comes in many other colors, such as radio or infrared, ultraviolet light, X-ray, gamma ray. All those lights are invisible to the naked eye. And the point I'm trying to make here is just as there are sounds and colors that we cannot see or hear, they exist. Well, the same is true with dimensions. We cannot hear or see them or understand them, but different uh, dimensions exist. I want to make a point that I think often goes unnoticed, and it's found in the book of John, John chapter 20, verses 26 through 27, which reads, and after eight days, again, the disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Verse 26, it states that the disciples were assembled together in a, in a house when Jesus appeared in them. The midst of them, the doors were shut. Could this be that Jesus was in another dimension? We certainly know that he was in another form. Because it, it says in verse 27, where he told Thomas to reach his hand and thrust it into his side. You can't do that in a three-dimensional body. Think about the natures of angels for a minute. Nature of angels. What do we know about angels in, in Scripture? They always appear in human form. In Sodom and Gomorrah, the men of the city thought the angels were men. And at the resurrection, at the ascension, Mary mistaken the angels at the sepulcher as gardeners. The angels could speak. The angels could speak. They took men by the hand and they would eat meals with them. Angels are capable of direct physical combat. We know that. We know that from the Passover in Egypt. We also know that they're uh, capable of physical combat. By the book of 2 Kings 19.35, where there was a slaughter of 185,000 Syrians when Jerusalem was delivered from the Assyrians. We have to face it that there are things that we cannot readily see with our physical eyes. But just because we can't see them doesn't mean they don't exist. When the disciples asked about his coming back, Jesus detailed the Precedent events in three Gospels, Matthew 24, 25, Mark 13, and Luke 21, 22. 
Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 24, 4, Take heed that no man deceive you. Jesus said, take heed that no man deceives you. When we're talking about being deceived and deception, we're talking about and dealing with spiritual dealings here, spiritual issues. Talking about spiritual matters. And we have to remember, we are dealing with doctrines of devils. First Timothy 4, 1 Timothy 4.1 tells us in these end times, there will be seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So what might an ultra-dimensional being look like? Well, first of all, we have to take seriously that these beings can coexist separately alongside our own dimension. And I suggest that they may look like angels. I'm not talking about the kind we think of with wings and halos. There are many instances in the Bible where angels appear but seemingly look human. We know that. We've already talked about that. Think of the account in Genesis where the angels appeared to Lot. They didn't appear to be angels to Lot at all. And one thing we have to remember, keep in mind when talking about angels, there are both good angels and bad angels. In Matthew 24, the disciples asked Jesus what would be the signs of his coming back. And one of those signs was that they, would, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that no entered the ark. We have to think what was going on back at that time. Jesus said it would be like the days of Noah. What was going on? Well, it was a wicked, evil time. We know that. There was mass partying. Genesis 6.5 tells us that. Wickedness was great. Genesis 6, 5 says that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of of the thoughts of his heart was on evil continually. But there was something else going on. What else was going on? Genesis 6, 2 says that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them as wives of all which they chose. What's this all about? This is about the fallen angels coming to earth and taking daughters of men as wives. Sons of God in the Hebrew is Benahalalim, meaning angels. We're talking about angels here. Adam was a direct creation of God, and, and we are sons of Adam. But angels were direct creation of God, and this is documented in Job 1.6, Job 2.1, and Job 38.7. Where the sons of God presented themselves before the Lord and Satan was with them. So what does this all mean? What does this mean that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and took them wives of all which they chose? So these angels took the daughters of men of wives and they procreated with them. That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about creating offspring. Their offspring is mentioned in Genesis 6, 4. There were giants in, in the earth in those days. And after also that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, and the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. So it was wicked in those, in, in, in those days of Noah. And Noah was the only one that found grace in the eyes of God. I don't believe we can imagine how wicked and how vile it was in those days. In verse 5, it, it says, The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was on evil all the time. And it's interesting, in a couple of verses that I read, it can be referred in the Hebrew language that many women in Noah's days, they, they dressed provocative, they wore makeup to to appear very seductive. And I would imagine that they would carry on with very sensual dances that appeal to the sons of God. And I tell you what, we're not too far off from that today. You just turn on TV and look at some of the videos. 
But Noah found grace in the eyes of God. The world has become so corrupt that the Lord brought the flood to destroy all wickedness. And that was the reason for the flood. The main reason was to destroy the wickedness, but also to wipe out the giant hybrids, the Nephilim. You see, if God didn't wipe out all the wickedness, it would eventually corrupt the bloodline that was carried down from Adam. And God's intent was to keep Noah's genealogy unblemished from these fallen angels. But this was Satan's strategy from the beginning, to blemish the bloodline from which Jesus Christ would come from. Make no mistake, these fallen angels, these are bad guys. Uh, Jude 6 and 7 tells us exactly who these guys are and where they're going to go. We're talking some bad stuff here. Uh, evil stuff. These guys were doing unnatural things. We're talking about these fallen angels. We're talking about sodomy and going after strange flesh. But God dealt with them. God destroyed them along with all evilness. 2 Peter 2, 4, 5 says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be served unto judgment. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Something interesting here uh, for those that study Greek mythology. The term cast down to hell in the Greek language is Tartarosus. It's a term for the dark abode of woe, the pit of darkness in the unseen world. But it's also interesting is that the word Tartarus appears in Greek literature. Tartarus, it's, it's used as a dungeon or torment in the suffering for the wicked and as the prison for the Titans. Remember the Titans? The Greek Titans, they were, they were considered partly terrestrial and partly celestial. And legend has it that they rebelled against their father Uranus. And after a prolonged contest, they were defeated by Zeus and condemned into Tartarus. Greek mythology is, has some interesting stuff. Have you ever considered the Greek divine heroes? We're talking about Atlas or Hercules. I can sort of see in these guys being as offspring of Nephilim, I mean, giant hybrids. I see them as mighty men, strong, intelligent. Think about it for a second. Nephilim, could it be the strength and might and intelligence that was behind the Great Pyramid at Giza? Could they be behind the Stonehenge in Britain? Could they be behind the Circle of the Raphium? Circle of Raphium. Last week, I neglected to mention the Circle of Raphium, but the Circle of Raphium is an ancient megalith monument consisting of concentric circles of stone with a big mound of earth in the center, sort of a, a burial cave. And this is located at the Israel, Israeli-occupied portion of the Golan Heights. Consider this, the circle of Rephraim is made up of five circles consisting of 42,000 rocks, some stones weighing 20 tons each. The structure is huge, it's 15 feet high, 520 feet in diameter, and it was created about 3,000 years BC. It's built on a flat plateau and it's only visible from above and it's located 10 miles from Astoreth Carneum. What's the purpose? the purpose of this circle of Raphium. Some believe it was a, a worship center, but others believe it to be the burial site for the remnant of the giants. One thing for sure, whoever built this monument had to be tall in structure. It had to be built with help from very large people that, that could see circles that normally can't be seen because this structure can really only be seen from above. Talking about the circle of Raphians, Raphians, they're mentioned in, in the Old Testament. They're mentioned in Genesis 14, 5, Joshua 12, 4, and 1 Chronicles 6, verse 71. 
So let's talk about the Nephilim for a minute. The flood of Noah wiped out the Nephilim and all the wickedness to preserve the bloodline of Adam. I call this the first influx, the first influx of the Nephilim. They were wiped out. But we also know that there was a second influx. Second influx of Nephilim are the are the post flood, and according to Genesis six four, we know that they were they happened because it says also after that. So we see that the Nephilim were before and after the flood, and they're mentioned throughout Genesis, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Second Samuel, and First Chronicle. They're mentioned as Raphaim, the Emim, the Horan, the Zamsumin, Arba, the Anak and his seven sons, the Anakim. Uh, Og, the king of Basham, and also Goliath and his four brothers. Of course, this was all attempts to attack the bloodline of Adam by Satan. And that's Satan's strategy. Satan's strategy is, is to pollute or destroy the bloodline from which Jesus Christ would come from. Satan's strategies are documented throughout the Old Testament. Uh, we can see it in Genesis 6 with the corruption, trying to corrupt the bloodline of Adam. Uh, you can see it with uh, Abraham's seed. Um, Satan tried it through famine in Genesis 50. He tried to destruct the male line. Pharaoh's pursuit, Satan tried to destroy the Israelites. The populating of Canaan, whether we read that in Genesis 12:6. Satan tried to come against David's bloodline, 2 Samuel 7. But Satan failed to corrupt the bloodline of Adam. So what did Satan do next? He attacked the bloodline of David. Because David is the bloodline from which Jesus would come from. We read of that in 2 Chronicles 21 and 22. Isaiah 36 and 38 and Esther 3. Bloodline of David, where Jehoram Jer kills his brothers and the Arabians slew all. Hezekiah assaulted, and of course, Haman's attempts to wipe out the Jews. Satan's strategy has always been to destroy the royal bloodline, to wipe out the Israelites, so, so Jesus couldn't descend from them. Satan has New Testament strategies as well. We've got to recall Matthew 1, Joseph's fears, um, Herod's attempt, Matthew 2, as Herod tried to wipe out all the Israelite children. At Nazareth, Luke 4, and the storms at the sea, Mark 4 and 8, and how about the cross? Satan tried to, to, to find victory there. But you guess what? Satan isn't finished yet. Satan used Hitler and attempted to wipe out the Jews. If you think about it, if, if Hitler wiped out the Jews in Jerusalem, prophetic prophecies couldn't take place regarding Israel. If Jerusalem was wiped out, Christ could not come back to Jerusalem as prophesied. Something else to consider. Ever wonder why there's so much tension around Golan Heights, the Hebron and Gaza Strip? What do they all have in common? Well, these are the areas that Joshua failed to exterminate, the Raphaim. That West Bank is the same area that's in dispute today. I think I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about alien abductions. What's this all about? We've heard of numerous accounts of people being abducted, and, there's, uh, and there continues to be a deluge of cases reported. It's too bizarre to accept this but it's also too frequent to consistently ignore. Oftentimes, those that have supposedly been abducted and gone under hypno hypnosis describe such events as physical zams and such. Could it be that these aliens are preoccupied with human production? I think of Genesis 6. The late John Mack, psychologist, dealt with 76 cases where he noted he noted that there was a high degree of consistency. All the stories, events seemed similar. There was also an absence of psychiatric illness. All these people that were supposedly abducted, they were all of sound mind. They were sound people. 
people that were abducted often had physical changes and lesions. All had some evidence of physical examination. But this was These were independently witnessed by others while abductions are taking place. And there was also the involvement of small children. Is it possible that in the not so future we can see prophecy taking place concerning the end times? Could it be the topic of these abductions is dealing with implanting and harvesting of human fetuses? Genesis 3.15 tells us the conflict between the two seeds. The conflict between the seed, the two seeds, the seed of woman and the seed of serpent. And of course, from that comes the red dragon, Satan, and the coming world leader and the false prophet. We are living in the days of seeing the book of Revelation fulfilled, and there are spiritual forces behind world powers today. We can't deny that. There is stuff going on. Remember a few months back? A few months back where we studied the book of Daniel, chapter 2 and chapter 7. The, the, the statue there. The statue represented the kingdoms of earth, while the stone represented the kingdom of God that would fill the earth. The dream foretold of successive kingdoms that would appear from Babylonian Empire down to the end of time. Daniel's vision of chapter 2 was explaining Nebuchadnezzar's dream, while Daniel's vision of chapter 7 was, was in his own dream. But I want to point out something to consider here. There is a verse in Daniel that is glossed over frequently. Daniel chapter 2 verse 41. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom, that there shall be in it of the strength of iron for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. What is this miry clay? Well, miry clay is made from mire and dust. Well, think about this for a second. The New World Order, the Ten Kings, uh, known as Rome II, is a mixture of iron and clay. Well, man, we're made from clay. What about this iron? What is this mixture of iron and clay? What if this is some sort of hybrid New Order, clay and iron? Could this be some sort of mingling with fallen angels and seed of men? Seems there could be some mischief in the end times. But concerning the end times, the last day, not only did Jesus tell us that it, as it would be as in the days of Noah, he also told us, Men's heart will fail them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. Christ went on, so went on to say, Take heed that no man deceives you. Jesus was telling the disciples what the end times would be like. He said, Don't be deceived. Men's heart will fail for the fear of things that are coming on the earth. I can see there coming a time where soon people will try to predate the Bible. They will say such things that, that such as that Jesus was an alien. There was an article published uh, in 2012 that proposed this hypothesis. The article hypothesized uh, hypothesized that in Mary's dream that she was visited by aliens and impregnated, impregnated by them. That's the reason Jesus had superhuman abilities. Now, I know this article is far-fetched far and far-stretched, but I'm telling you that times are coming where people will believe anything. Think about this for a moment. Uh, when people see aliens, what do they see? Well, they see lights. They see lots of lights. Well, Scripture tells us that when Elijah and Moses appeared to the disciples, that their raiment became shining. Mark 9, 4. People can take this and they can fill in their own interpretation. Uh, interpretation. People can explain it away, saying it was aliens. You can see how this will play out in the end times. They could take Genesis 1, 1 and say aliens were sent here. We have to remember that we're living in different dimensions and we're dealing with spiritual stuff. 
demons will come and try to deceive us. We're warned about that in 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 5. We are told that people, people will turn from the truth and hearken to fables. Yeah, folks, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on right now. And as we get closer to the end times, we will see Antichrist make his appearance. Think about it. What's the world looking for today? The world's not looking for a theological savior. The world is looking for a technical savior. The world's looking for a technical savior, one that will appear, who will solve the problems of famine, a, a savior that will solve the problems of war, a savior that will solve the problems of disease. The world today is looking for someone who will appear and create what ungenerate men want heaven on earth on their own terms. What better way for the force of darkness to reveal themselves on earth than to appear as saviors of mankind? Let's face it, the world today has embraced the occult, and the world of occult has embraced ufology. People in the occult talk much about being in contact with alien beings, people, and UFOs. And some of these supposed encounters with aliens, beings have, have said men that uh, they've told men they should not fear death as reincarnation happens and there are people living all over the cosmos, all over the universe. Planets populated by souls which have lived here and died and been reincarnated elsewhere. Does this sound familiar? There's cults that teach that out there. People who are in contact with UFOs, occupants of ship, say they talk with them about the truth of reincarnation, about universal salvation for all mankind. This should be most revealing. It seems to be a theology with the alien beings. They don't believe in God as a personal being. These, these aliens, they don't believe that Jesus Christ is the only Savior. They don't believe that the Bible alone is God's word to the world. They do not believe in punishment. They do not believe in the resurrection. They believe instead of reincarnation and that man himself can evolve from planet to planet to perfection. What we are dealing with is a theology opposed to Christianity. A serious evaluation needs to be considered that perhaps we are dealing with the ultra-dimensional beings here. Alternative dimensional beings who have the capacity to manifest themselves in our atmosphere and to convince anybody with signs and lying wonders who may be able to demonstrate with third and fourth dimensional graphics satisfy people on earth what took place in the past. We have to consider that's where we're, we're coming to. We're coming to where UFOs and aliens try to rewrite the past. You know, think about artificial intelligence, uh, AI. There's a lot of talk about that today. And we have to consider how AI plays into this equation. Think about where AI artificial intelligence is today. Even Elon Musk has said that we are at a point with AI that if it gets out of its cage, we are doomed. AI, we're talking about digital intelligence. Digital intelligence is past the point to what humans can do right now. AI can write well and it can write fast. Artificial intelligence can, can now write poetry that most and many poetry writers can't compete even with poetic skill. Few understand the implications behind artificial intelligence. Essentially, we're talking about a learning machine. A learning machine. Everything you do, everything you look at is collected. How long you spend at a, looking at a picture on the internet or a Facebook post. How long you stand in a grocery line or look at an item in the store. What you weed, what you, where you go, how you drive where you spend your money. Folks have no understanding how much information is gathered on you, even by that device you hold in your hand. 
People spend an average of five and a half hours on their mobile phones daily. They, they check their phone an average of 58 times. All the time they're doing this, AI is learning. AI is a learning machine. It's constantly learning from our behavior. Artificial intelligence can generate text, can generate voice. In fact, in fact most spam calls you get are AI generated and some are hard to distinguish from the real deal. I mean, their voices are so real. <clears throat> and AI software, it continues to prove all the time for its voice synthesizers. AI can figure problems, predict models from our behavior. It can suggest options. Look what's going on in the current conflict in Gaza Strip uh, be between Israel and Hamas. This has generated insurmountable amounts of information. And what's happening, however, is that AI is creating huge data pools of misinformation. Again, this is based on individual behavior models on what people are searching for. We're talking nothing more than mind control here. Artificial intelligence AI can look, look the way, you, can, can, AI can change the, the way you look at things, the way you behave. Um, all through misinformation. Of course, this changes your actions, what you believe. Consider this of the future. Think about how AI can influence elections, can even be used as a tool in elections. How can you have a democracy like that? So I have to ask the question, are we using the AI tool or is the AI tool using us? Think about this. How many free apps do you have on your phone? Apps you don't pay for. We all have them. We have them because they're free. We like free stuff. Why? Because we're not paying for it. We believe we're getting a free product. But guess what? You're not, a, you're not getting a free product. You've become the product. You've become the product for AI to gather information on you. You've been hooked. You're not alone. We all got free apps. I got free apps on my phone. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that, but I don't want anyone to think that they're isolated from Big Brother. Because Big Brother is alive and well and tracking your everywhere you go, every, mo every movement you look and take, everything you look at. I can see where this is going. I see where we have this end time beast. This world system powered by AI, artificial intelligence. Scripture tells us in Revelation 13, 15, that power is given to the beast to breathe and speak. What if the same demons that are doing phenomenal things can produce what looks like consciousness in a mechanical device? I have to believe that that's what we're dealing with here is ultra-dimensional beings. I believe that there's a time where they will debunk our religion. A time is coming where they, they will say that Moses got the Ten Commandments from an astronaut who, who cut him out of a rock with some sort of ray gun. Would not it be amazing if some sort of advanced race purported to be the savior of all mankind and creator of Homo sapiens? And at the, ages, at the end of ages purported to be our deliverer instead of our deceiver. Second Thessalonians 2 tells us that Satan appears in human form and he appears as the Antichrist who will deceive all unrighteous men to destruction. He is believed by those who refuse the knowledge of the truth. This is all stuff <clears throat> to think about. And as I conclude, as I conclude this study, I, I can't accept the idea that UFOs are, ho are a hoax. There's just too much evidence there. I can't accept that UFOs and aliens, they're an obscure phenomena such as lightning or marsh gas. And I don't believe that they are intergalactic or interplanetary. And they're not a secret weapon. There's, there's not evidence there to support that. And I will consider at the end of ages, the signs of heavens, to be very careful that what we put our trust in, including people who come from other worlds or other dimensions. It might be that these UFOs are real, but real because they are the working power from Satan with all signs of power and lying wonders. Let's face it, Satan is the god of this age. 
At the end of the age, he could claim to be savior. That's always been his game. UFOs are real, and evidence from the occult is that they're hostile to Christianity. In that conclusion, my position is that our hope is not with other individuals from other worlds, but with Christ, who died once for us, delivered to the saints. Christ is the same today, yesterday, and tomorrow. With that said, how are we to live? How are we to live? Luke 21.34 tells us, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that day comes upon you unawares. Luke 21.28 And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Colossians 2.8 Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Ephesians 4.14 says that he henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slay of man, and cunning craftiness, which by thy lie and wait to deceive. Luke 21.8 and he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. Folks, the Christian church is looking for that blessed hope in 2.13, the return of Jesus Christ for his church. Let us, as, as children of God, always be mindful in the days the the, the days we live. Let us not be deceived. Let us always be awake. Amen and amen.